care. It's uh, handling sensitive data like database passwords, tokens to third party APIs, etc. It's also sharing settings between your team members and as we all know, uh, Django settings is a regular Python code so it could have some tricky and non obvious logic. Uh, there are different approaches uh, to, sell, to solve this issue, so let's briefly uh, talk about the most popular ones. So settings local approach, it's maybe the most simplest and the most uh, older uh, thing. So uh, you split your settings to uh, base settings in settings.py and environment specific settings to settings local.py. Um, this approach partially solves issue with sensitive data, uh, but still it has a lot of disadvantages. Uh, so the next approach is uh, separate settings file for each environment. Uh, with this approach you uh, separate uh, your settings by environment, still you have this base file, so it's like an extension of previous uh, method. And it's solve this issue with different environments there in version control system and it's easy to share uh, settings between developers but still you need somehow handle secret um, secret data and still you have this inheritance. Uh, the next approach is uh, environment variables and this is just some basic example and has some issues so let's have a look on advanced example. Um, Instead of using os.environ uh, directly, it's better to write some uh, wrapper and to uh, handle k error and also you can add their default values and type conversion, but it's better to use a third party application. Uh, we will talk about uh, it uh, later in several slides. Uh, so this approach has a lot of uh, advantages. Uh, finally, we have configuration uh, separate from code. You have environment parity between all your servers. There is no inheritance. And also there is a theoretical grounding for using environment variables for configuration. Uh, it's 12 factors. So 12 factors, it's a collection of recommendation uh, to build uh, web apps. Uh, to be easily deploy and scale in cloud. It was created by Heroku, a well-known cloud uh, hosting provider. And in terms of this talk, we are interested in configuration factor, which literally says that we need to use environment variables for this. So if you're not familiar with 12 factor, I strongly recommend you to check their website. They have really clear explanations for each factor and uh, architecture all in all. And now let's go back to the tooling and uh, we found that uh, Django Environ, it's a very convenient app. It has a really nice API that handles all type conversion, uh, default values, etc. So let's have a look on examples. That's how your settings uh, look before. That's how they look after applying Django Environ. So the code became clearer and more readable. So please check this up. Uh, several uh, words about uh, structure. Uh, we recommend to split your settings, but not by environment, but by groups. And in this case, you can differentiate uh, it from Django, third party, and your custom settings. And if your uh, project uh, will be growing, you can implement each of these files as a package and split it more granularly. And as we all know, uh, naming variables is the <laughs> most hardest part of the development. So this works as settings too. Uh, we cannot imply on Django or third party settings, but we can follow these simple rules for our custom settings. So let's give them uh, meaningful names, uh, use prefix uh, with the project name for our custom settings and write descriptions. So let's quickly summarize. Keep, uh, keep settings in environment, uh, don't hard code, uh, split settings into group, and follow naming conventions. Uh, this is the link to slides and other resources. Also, please check uh, article on our blog site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, our next speaker is Seth. Seth, if you can jump up on stage and get ready. Um, so. 
I, I arrived in, in uh, Denmark for the first time uh, on Tuesday, and uh, on the train coming in from the airport, I actually had a really broke up a start of a really interesting conversation with a local who told me a piece about a, a bit of history about a, a, a Spanish gentleman who came to live in Denmark uh, named Juan, uh, who's, who's come down and become very, very well known in, in Denmark. Um, for the impact that he's had on, on politics and, and sort of the, the Danish way of life. Uh, Juan, Juan was just universally loved by his neighbours. He was just a, a quiet guy, lived by himself, kept to himself, but, uh, but, but was just a, a model for, for what a citizen should be. You know, came from Spain, came to live in Denmark, became a model, a model citizen. Uh, and uh, everyone was sort of wondering, how, how does he get to be such a good citizen? Um, are we ready? Do we have slides? No? No, we still don't have slides yet. Okay. Um, so uh, the, his next door neighbour sort of found out about found out about uh, about Juan first and came over and had a bit of a chat with him and sort of find out what was going on and and learned sort of re this really really valuable lesson um, and and took it back and and started to, to live his own life following the same uh, rules and patterns that that Juan had taught him in this in this really really simple conversation that had happened. Uh, and, and again, sort of the message started going, all of a sudden there was two people living next door to each other that were living the best possible life, uh, and, and, and everybody around them started to notice that you know, here are two very, very happy people living the best model of what it is to be a Dane in the, in, in the modern world. Um, we're still going? <laughs> still waiting for slides? Okay. Um, Yes, we have, we have slides now. All right, so we will continue the story of one after Seth Yastrov talks to us about type checking your Django. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to talk about type checking your uh, Django project. Um, so if, if you don't know, uh, Python has uh, 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 type annotations uh, added since Python 3, and you can also put them in, uh, you can also put uh, type annotations in your Python 2 code with some type comments. Um, uh, MyPy is a, a type checker. Uh, yeah, you can install it, and let's say you have a, a function, uh, and you want to annotate the, um, the argument uh, and return type. You can call it with the wrong type, in this case, string, although it should be an int. You get an error. So that's great. But what if you want to type check your Django code? Um, well, there are stub files which define the uh, interface uh, for all sorts of Django functions, classes, and so on. Um, it's a project on GitHub by uh, Maxim Kornikov and other people have contributed as well. You can just pip install it uh, to your project. So let's say I made a, a Django uh, project uh, and I want to type check it with MyPy. So I make a... Um, a MyPy uh, INI file and add in some uh, options and then run it and I get this error about need some type annotation, something in the settings. Um, uh, let's see, and if I add this uh, plugin to this config, the plugin comes with the, the stubs, it will not complain. And this uh, plugin, it does some cool magic stuff so that you can actually type check uh, some of the cool Django features like the ORM. So if you try to construct some uh, uh, object uh, model and it doesn't have uh, actually the attribute you're, you're using, it will uh, tell you about that. Um, uh, let's say you have a, a character field on your model uh, and you try to pass it a, a uh, none, but it's not nullable. Uh, it will complain about that. Um, let's say you have, uh, yeah, let's say you uh, have a relation to a, a foreign key, uh, to a, a related model, and you try to access uh, that on another model and access field on that. It will also be able to follow that relation and uh, type check that field. So in this case, you can't uh, add one, an integer to a string this name on the publisher. Um, and finally, a more complicated example. Um, uh, if you are using this uh, values list uh, function to, to get, in this case, just one value from a, a query as your result, in this case, the, the name field of this uh, person model, 
then you should get a string back, but because you are only asking for the first row, you might get a, a none back if the, the row didn't exist. So actually, um, if you try to pass this to a, a function that takes a string, it will complain because it might, have a, it might actually be none, and we had a strict optional setting uh, enabled on MyPy. So this is very cool. Um, there are also non-ORM stuff, uh, these stubs. Um, there are stubs for pretty much all of Django, but it's probably not entirely correct or incomplete um, because a lot of it was generated with uh, some tools. Um, yes, thanks. Um, if you have a custom settings module, you can also specify that in a config file and it will uh, understand that. And um, you can contribute uh, at GitHub. Um, it's um, uh, actively developed and there's also a Gitter channel. Um, and there's also a related plugin and stubs if you're using uh, Django REST framework. Um, so where to go from here? Um, yeah, the project has some tests actually on type checking the Django tests itself, which they don't all pass, so um, there's some things ignored. Uh, but if more of them pass, um, then it's, it kind of shows that it, it's pretty legit or at least pretty accurate and not giving false positives. And you guys should try it out on your projects. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, well, our next speaker gets set up. So uh, Juan has told his next door neighbor uh, about this great secret, and now we've got two people living their best lives, their best Danish lives. Uh, they uh, then start, the, pe the people in the rest of the street, uh, uh, they notice this is going on, and so they come over and they say, so, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the big secret here? And they, Seth and, uh, sorry, uh, Juan and, the, uh, uh, and his neighbor both share this, this one little short secret about how to live your best life. And uh, um, yeah, so I'll get ready. Um, so our next speaker is Francois Segon. Uh, take it away. Hey, bonjour, hi, my name is Francois Segon. Uh, my Twitter handle is Holdy. It's not an Indian restaurant in Liverpool, in case you see some mentions. Uh, I work at Poly Conseil uh, in Paris, a company uh, which, among other things, uh, we make information systems. Um, behind electric vehicle charging uh, and car sharing systems such as Source London and Blue LA in Los Angeles. So um, I switched careers uh, actually a year ago. Uh, I've been working at Polyconseil for six months and my mission at the moment is how to implement pri privacy by default in an existing Django app. So we have a million lines of code uh, approximately so uh, I couldn't afford to do it by hand and manually. Uh, I'm not crazy and I'm very lazy. So um, also, if I missed anything, that could cause uh, a very bad personal data leak. So I'll take an example in logs. For example, we, what if we logged something very badly? Uh, a customer would uh, edit uh, their details. So we have a, an email address, we have a phone number, uh, um, birth date, some additional details. Uh, what we wanted was some, something with redacted values, something that would be anonymized or pseudonymized. Um, so the solution we came uh, to was, for instance, an example with uh, strings. I have a, a variable that is a name, it's a string, the value is Jean-Michel, it's very French. And uh, what we do is uh, we wrap it, we give it an alternative value, and it turns it into a, a different object that has an original value, Jean-Michel, and an, a, a, an alternative value which is redacted. So um, what we do then is we wrap the callables. For instance, if I want to print the name, um, <clears throat> it, the, um, the, the object we'll call the Dunder STR uh, method. And this uh, method, the method has been redefined to check uh, the context. Am I supposed to show the, the original value or show an alternative value? If it's supposed to be redacted, then I return redacted. And of course, if not, I return Jean-Michel. Um, so next, for the fields, um, in the database, we have a, a lot of customers. Uh, so we have, for instance, a table with a type of our car, with Jean-Michel. And I have this new field now, um, so I need to to do, uh, define a new mixin. And this mixin just redefines two methods from db value. 
So from the database, we wrap the value, and the pre-save method uh, that unwraps the value from the field to the database. Uh, we also have a, a model mix-in, uh, which just redefines the set, uh, the, the, the method set hatch, uh, to wrap the value of fields that contain personal data. So if I do customer.name equals Jean-Michel, uh, this is the method that is called. And to help with all of that, I have two context decorators. So it's both a decorator and a context manager at the same time. Hide personal data and show personal data. And we can imb imbricate them. Uh, so remember, we had the logs at the beginning. So a very quick recap about logging. Uh, I have a message. I have a level. I give it to my Python object, the, a logger, and, um, we has, which has several handlers, maybe. A handler can be uh, logged to a file or to the console or uh, send an email, whatever. And I can add a, a formatter. So what I do is, when I don't want to show the personal data, I just use a decorator on the formatter. If I, for some reason, want to show the personal data, I can use the other uh, decorator. And this is how I can uh, obtain this very nice uh, redacted log. Um, so what are the next steps? Um, obviously, this is very, very, very simplified. There's room for improvement. And the uh, next step is, of course, open sourcing. Um, else, I still have one minute. So as a bonus, um, also we have um, custom template tags. Um, how do we do that? In the template node, we check a permission to see if we can, if we should show or hide um, the value. Um, and this template tag can be used with filters. So, for instance, I can I can do a hello uh, with a customer name. Uh, I just need to give it the custom the variable with a filter. In this case, an uppercase filter, and give it the permission. The condition it also works with um, a form, and I can just add the uh, a bootstrap filter if I want to. Um, if you don't know what GDPR is, um, it's a little late, but <laughs> but there was an amazing talk last year at Django Europe 2018. It was by Will Hardy. It was called "Protecting Personal Data with Django because it's the law," and this is for me. All for me. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. And bonus points for having a hyphen in someone's name. I like it. Um, all right, so we've, uh, uh, Juan has converted his entire street and taught the entire street about uh, this, this, this simple message about how to live your best life. And uh, it doesn't take long before when something like that happens that the government finds out. Um, and so the local, uh, the local city found out about it, and they were uh, interested in finding out about this message. We'll find out a little bit more about that after Sasha Romain introduces us to a different secret. Uh, take it away, Sasha. Thank you. So if you've seen me around, or if you've been to more DangoCons, uh, you may have seen me hand out these delicious little cookies called Stropafels. I bring them from Amsterdam. Uh, they're like two waffles with some gooey sweet syrup in between. Very tasty. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been bringing them to DangoCon for years, at least. So far, I've been involved in uh, handing out about 56 kilograms of these cookies, uh, of which 16 kilo was sugar. So I've contributed about 255 million calories of Stropafel to open source communities. This is enough for an adult to live on for six months, uh, but you would not feel well. And then there's also the secret society of the Stropafel, which started some years ago. And you can actually become a member. There's a small initiation ritual, and then you can get your hand stamped with our logo. Uh, the secret is I don't actually know how many members there are because the stamp fades after a day, so I can't keep track. I think we have about 300. And um, why am I doing all of this? Like, when I meet new people here also, they ask, like, you know, what is the deal with the straw bubbles in the jungle community? And I do it because it's just really fun. Um, because like, you know, when I meet people for the first time, sometimes they're initially a little wary, like strange person from Amsterdam handing out some food. I get asked a lot whether there's weed in it. And, uh, you know, people who know me, they sometimes get really enthusiastic. Like I've had people run down the hallway when they saw me uh, again to ask whether I brought any strop apples. And so the fun is mainly in like, how enthusiastic people get about this, because these cookies cost me about six cents. So, you know, it's not like a major effort. And um, 
basically the reason is for me like it's not just about the cookie or I don't think it's just about the cookie for these people. It is also bringing them a little bit of happiness. It's a random gesture of kindness, even though it's small and that matters to people. So in a way, the secret society of uh, the Stropafel is actually the secret society of happiness. And when we think about happiness, we often talk about, we th often think about very big things about your life partners, about getting married, about children, about moving to a different country. And uh, if you recognize the colors on my shirt, you'll know I know some things about big changes. But uh, we often tend to forget how it can also come from really tiny things, that really small acts of kindness, small gestures, can make a really big difference. They can make someone feel better after they've had uh, a bad day or, or something happened or they're just not, not feeling so well. Small things can add up for them. And uh, one of the ways uh, in which uh, you can contribute to this is a project Mikey mentioned earlier, Open Source Happiness Packets, which is basically a platform where we try to get people, mainly in open source, to say nice things to each other. So if you uh, saw a talk from a speaker that you really liked or you had a conversation with someone that, that made you feel good or you learned something or it cheered you up, then you can send them a happiness packet. We've had 930 cents since we first launched this in Budapest. And uh, a lot of them are public also. And uh, so some of my favorites include, it is people like you that make me truly happy to be involved in open source. These are public with permission. And uh, you all deserve way more praise and accolades than I can possibly give. And there are another 100 public on the website. So um, we've had 930 cents, and there are enough people here that I'm sure we could get to 1,000. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who've met someone that they appreciated, something that somebody did for them. Maybe it was a commerce organizer, maybe a speaker, a volunteer, uh, anyone really. But also, like happiness packets are not the only way. There are so many small acts that we can do uh, that maybe we don't even think about so much ourselves, that don't take so much effort, but they can make uh, a big difference to everyone else, to someone else. Uh, don't all start bringing unhealthy foods because that doesn't scale, <laughs> but there are many ways. Uh, so my name is Sasha. I've been called the monarch of stropafel based happiness. Please join the secret society of happiness. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, while our next speakers get set up, uh, so Juan has been been called on by the state, uh, by, by this local city government. They've invited him into a meeting. Juan goes into this meeting so that he can help share this message about how he lives his, his best life. The message that he shared with his uh, his neighbours and the uh, and the rest of the people on his street. And the the government's really really interested about this and wants to expand the program. Um, we'll find out more about what they did uh, after Karina and Jessica talk to us about Pineam Scholars. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Jessica, and I want to talk to you about Panam Scholars. Panam Scholars is a subgroup of the Python Namibia Society, and um, they are Python coding clubs in high schools. Okay, so um, one of the things that we have always been struggling with is computers. So this picture was taken at one of our Friday classes. We have two hour classes on every Friday, except for when it's school holiday or when the kids are going home. So we have always struggled with computers, as I just said, and um, we have done plenty of things to overcome this or be able to practice even without um, uh, computers. So um, what I want to uh, say that I have not really said in a lot of talks that I've had is to thank uh, the Cardiff, no, the Cardiff University because they've always when they have a representative coming to PyCon Namibia, they've always brought at least one computer that they are not using. So, and that's one of the, uh, the computers that we are using there. So we share them, we have four now, and we share them, some break and so forth, but currently we have four that are working, so I want to send them a special thank you. Um, so one of the things that we do is what we call computer day. I've spoken a lot about this, or extensively about this, uh, at JangoCon Europe 2018. So if you want to know how we do it and know in depth about it, uh, you can watch the video online on YouTube. 
So uh, what, uh, what we have been trying to do this year, what we are trying to plan to do is that we extend it to be a six-day uh, training instead of just a two-day conference uh, because we have had schools from villages that joined the society and we don't want them to come all the way just to come for a two-day conference. So we want to change it and extend it for six days. So if you want to be involved in terms of coming to be a mentor or a tutor um, or teach about something in Python, we are more than happy to have you on the team and collaborate with you. Yeah, so we have uh, had six schools now this year that joined the society, so we are quite happy about that. And that's one of the schools in the north. And that's what happened after we drove 13 hours to go to that school. So that's why we want to extend computer day to be a six days thing instead of just two days. Right, so one of the things that happened this year is also that we had, uh, we joined, or we finalized the partnership with NSDO and ASB Hamburg. So NSDO is the Namibia Sun Development Organization. So they um, give matrices, school desks, uh, used computers from, that are donated by ASB Hamburg. And um, I heard about them through, a, I've been a teacher for three years, and I heard about them through a parent because I was always complaining about the lack of computers at the school and things like that. And then she introduced me to this guy. So when I spoke to him, he told me, no, we give computers to primary schools and we give computers to schools that are dominated by the Sun community because they are marginalized. And so after a few meetings, I convinced him to give computers to schools that are not dominated by the Sun community and secondary schools. So this year we had our final meeting and we met the ASB Hamburg group and we are now going to receive computers from them. So they are going to be, let's say, giving uh, a full computer lab or a, like 20 computers to a school. And then we give them like an amount of money to help them cover the cost that they incur when the computers come. So um, Namibia has about uh, 1,000, they have more than 1,700 schools. So we have a long way to go. They are not <laughs> going to help. So we have had um, a couple of things that we also try to do that we have been doing to try and raise funds. And uh, Karina will be talking to you a little bit more about that. I met her at uh, Yangokon Europe 2018 and she has helped me, especially with the emotional worrying of things and things like that. So she's going to talk to you a little bit more about her ideas. Hello. I'm going to talk more about the ways that, that we could uh, uh, help uh, uh, to contribute. Well, there is a Patreon uh, link. Uh, we will post it to, on Slack also, uh, and you can donate uh, directly here on, uh, on the link. But uh, also, you could uh, could uh, get more creative ways, could find more creative ways to to do this. For example, uh, well, I myself I uh, pledge to give a, a free one-day beginner lesson uh, for three people uh, who <laughs> in London who. Uh, so you can, but you you can also do that, the same, uh, but maybe something different like guitar lesson, or you could uh, uh, make a plush Django pony, Django pony, <laughs> or uh, maybe you have some other ideas uh, to give us rewards for other people who donate uh, uh, to to this uh, project. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have one last speaker. Uh, this, this, the, the, the local city government has found out about one. They've, they've met with one. They've come up with a grand plan for, you know, we can, we can do this. This is actually quite a simple thing to do. And, but unfortunately, before they actually got to the point where they were able to deploy this, uh, this grand plan out, uh, one was abducted. Uh, and, they, and the abductors took him out to, uh, to a golf course. Uh, and he was, was there in the middle of the golf course, and uh, uh, there was like they were trying to, to stop him because they like they, they, they didn't want the, the whole society to change. They were like they liked things the way they were, uh, and there was you know there was a it was tense. There was there was a there was, there was yelling. Juan's a very nice guy, very calm guy, obviously you know living his best Danish life, um, and there was this there was a struggle, and unfortunately Juan was shot, and uh, we'll find out what happened after that. After we have uh, Christoph Bujinovitz. Hi, 
uh, I'm Chris. Uh, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter with my handle, at Buinevich. Uh, I'm currently working at Plecto. I'm a senior software developer and head of Warsaw Office. And I'm going to talk to you really quickly about uh, keeping a request wide state in Django. And that's not to be confused with global state, because global state is very bad. It lacks isolation. You can leak pretty much anything to another request. So, for example, user data. And Django tries really hard to get rid of pretty much all instances of uh, global state that are. Uh, still there, and we should be striving to do as well in our applications. Uh, an example of request-wide state is, for example, uh, internationalization in Django. So whenever we use uh, the I18N framework, which includes also the, the middleware, we're actually not passing around the language around. We keep that in something that's called uh, thread local storage. And uh, as a matter of fact, it doesn't have any magic involved. It's just using a common Python construct uh, in such a way that allows us to obtain and read the data from any point in our application, including our library code, uh, at any point in, in a request cycle. Uh, so a really quick code uh, example is uh, we can have a state file which just uses uh, one simple import and a pair of getter and setter. And we can use that from, from middleware to set the object at the beginning of a request uh, and then reset it at the end of the, the request. That's fairly important because we don't want to um, leak the data to later requests. And at any point after this middleware runs, uh, and before it returns, we can access the data. So uh, you can put anything you need uh, in the application, for example, library code or uh, some custom code related to location and geographical bindings, for example, or um, maybe you want to keep the request itself as, as in this example for debugging purposes. Yeah. And you need to use it with caution. Please don't, don't abuse that. Uh, you generally still want to pass variables around like in normal, like any responsible programmer would do. That is pretty much still a global state, but it's bound to a one request. So you just solve some issues with isolation, but uh, it's still a bit messy and indirect way. It just helps resolve some issues. Okay, so that's it. I think we have two more minutes left. That was a quick one. Thank you.